welcome you to um, the Winter Quarters uh, program in the um, McLean Center seminar series on ethical issues in organ transplantation. We're, we're just delighted that Dr. Gottlieb will be the first speaker in that series. Um, as many of you know, uh, Larry Gottlieb is professor of surgery, uh, directs the um, burn unit and the complex wound center, um, and has been a faculty member of the McLean Center for Medical Ethics. Uh, after graduating from Penn State, uh, Larry completed his general surgery residency at Yale New Haven Hospital um, and at the LA County USC Medical Center. His clinical and research interests include reconstructive microsurgery and patient care, and he serves as a program director of the Reconstructive Microsurgery Fellowship here at the university. He's also active on many other uh, tumor boards, melanoma board, head and neck cancer, pelvic health, and the like. Uh, today, today, I'm delighted that Larry is returning to a topic that's been, that's been of considerable interest to us, and that is the topic of composite tissue allografts. Um, those of you who attended the McLean conference may recall that the first day uh, we had two talks, one by Dr. Breidenbach, um, who did the first American um, hand transplant, an example of composite tissue allograft. And then Maria Simonoff from the Cleveland Clinic talked about doing the first facial transplant, another example of the vascular composite tissue allografts. Today, Larry is going to talk about vascular composite allografts of the abdominal wall. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you, and thanks so much. I have a little different perspective, uh, although I am positive towards uh, composite tissue allografts, uh, I, I think they gave somewhat of a skewed point. So what I'm really going to talk about uh, today, rather than what it was originally billed as, is update controversies and thoughts on vascular composite allografts. In addition, we will have the abdominal wall part uh, at the end, just because it's that's not an hour's worth of discussion. But this, I think, is. I have nothing to disclose. So what's a vascular composite allograft? As many of you know, it's a non-solid organ body part that may be transplanted from one person to another, just like a hand, a face, a larynx, an abdomen, basically any part of the body at all. It needs to be harvested from a heart-beating cadavers. It needs to be revascularized in a timely fashion. Warm and cold ischemia times are similar to solid organ transplants. So Mark used the term composite tissue allograft. I'm using the term vascular composite allografts. Anybody know the difference? There is none. But it's really important. Uh, and why was there a major push to change the name? Human cells and tissues and cellular tissue-based products are under the auspices of the FDA. Solid organs are covered by NODA under the auspice of HRSA. Composite tissue allografts, CTA, are not designated. But it's anticipated in the near future uh, to be designated either under the FDA or HRSA. The issues related to recovery, matching, and allocation of the CTAs are similar to organs, as I mentioned, and they're not adequately addressed by the FDA. Defining a CTA as organs would give them coverage under NOTA and oversight over HRSA, not the FDA. And the FDA is a pain in the ass. Uh, nobody wants to be under the regulations of the FDA. We ran a tissue bank years ago, and it was very, very cumbersome. Therefore, to avoid the confusion, lest somebody might think composite tissue allograft was a tissue and would thereby come under the auspices of the FDA, we wanted to remove the word tissue. After much debate, everyone agreed to change the name to composite tissue allograft. They tried other things, uh, two vascular composite allograft. They tried CVA, but that had a sort of a negative connotation. Uh, and putting everything together, this seemed to work best. 
So now the appropriate lingo is VCA rather than CTA. So today, today's talk, uh, I'm going to have basically four parts that are sort of interrelated. Abbreviated history, surgical history of how we got here, an update on the VCA from my perspective, a little abdominal wall 101 for those of you that are not surgeons, and then a little bit of abdominal wall transplant. So the first written recordings of surgery is way back 5,000 years. Anybody know the connection to the Edwin Smith papyrus to the University of Chicago? It was translated by Breston, who started the Oriental Institute in 1906. Reconstructive surgery, uh, actually any written report, goes back 3,000 years to India to Sushta, who has these volumes and volumes, um, everything you can imagine. He's really considered the first father of surgery. Reconstruction, reconstructive surgery is the use of surgery to restore and form the functions of the body. Frequently inform, involves transferring or transplanting tissue from one place to another on the same patient. If you will, autologous reconstruction or perhaps autologous transplantation. Shrista was the first to record the use of skin grafts and flaps to reconstruct the nose. Does everybody know the difference between a skin graft and a flap? If you do, I'll just go on. If you don't, I'll explain it. Want to explain flap, it? A flap has a vascular kind Right, and a graft is just taken from one part to another. It could be skin, it could be bone, it could be tendon, it could be whatever it is. After the original papers or, or volumes in 600 BCE, other than the legends of Cosmos and Damien, which we've all learned about in our ethics lectures, there's really no trace of reconstructive surgery in the literature until the 1400s. And the first one we start hearing about is this Branca family uh, in Sicily in 1450. But they, weren't, they didn't really make it. And they didn't make it because they didn't write anything. Uh, and they, like anything else, if you don't write, you don't get, your name doesn't go on it. And Taglia Kazi, became really the founder of modern plastic surgery from his uh, book that he wrote uh, on reconstructing the nose. And this is the uh, original picture from that book and where he says, we repair and fix the body parts that were given by nature and taken away by fate. We do this not to please the eye, but to support the injured person's hopes and help his soul. His work was condemned by his contemporaries and they regarded his operations as illegal and crimes against nature. He was eventually buried in an unconsecrated grave. Getting back to CTA, there's a legend that he transplanted the nose from a slave to a nobleman. And allegedly, the transplant failed when the donor, when the, uh, when the donor died three years later, and there's a, a statue of him holding the nose. 200 years later, uh, the Gentleman's Magazine ran an article that basically reported the old ancient Indian uh, technique. And Joseph Carpu was the first European to practice this Indian method of rhinoplasty. In the late 18th and 20th century, there was an explosion of reconstructive techniques described, including way back in 1864, the first groin flap for uh, uh, extrophy of the bladder. There was details of every artery and vein in the body without any x-rays or anything else by Manchot in 1889. And Wagenstein described the TFL flap in 1934 and then bipedical thoracal epigastric class by Webster in 37. The next main, main advance also we've seen uh, and heard about at this conference, which is Alexis Carell, also connected to the University of Chicago with his vascular anastomosis and his also auto uh, transplantation of the hind limb, kidney, and the scalp. The father of modern plastic surgery is considered to be Sir Harold Gillies. And he had all these principles, which there were about 16 that then got expanded to many more. And the most important one in, for this lecture is replace like with like. 
And in World War I, there was a new injury. It was these massive facial injuries, basically because of trench warfare. People put the heads up and get the faces blown off. And nobody knew how to deal with it at all. And so Sir Howard Gillies was uh, commissioned to, okay, all of a sudden you're a plastic surgeon. Actually, he was an anti-surgeon at the time. He established the principles of modern reconstructive surgery, one of them being replace like with like. He developed the tube pedicle flap, and this may seem gross to you. This is an intermediate stage, and the only way at that time to get tissue to the face or from one place to another was to make this tube in multi-stages uh, and waltz it up and ultimately have it cover a nose, a mouth, a forehead, whatever it might be. Uh, and this was really revolutionary because before people would just walk around with the big holes. Nobody else knew what to do at all. He and his uh, student, Ralph Millard, uh, wrote the book on principles and art of plastic surgery. And Millard went on to write a famous book of principalizations of plastic surgery where he says, when a part of one's person is lost, it should be replaced in kind, bone for bone, muscle for muscle, hairless skin for hairless skin, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. The problem with autologous reconstruction is frequently we don't have those parts available. The next major uh, advance is uh, Peter Medawar, who many of you know, uh, was a biologist who worked on skin graft rejection. And he discovered acquired immune tolerance, which was really the fundamental research that led to uh, tissue and organ transplantation today. And he also won the Nobel Prize 30 years uh, later. Joseph Murray, we've also talked about. Key is that he's a plastic surgeon. And when he wasn't doing kidney transplants, he was fixing pressure sores and abdominal walls. And in 1990, he won the Nobel Prize. The ma next major change, of course, was the advent of new immunosuppressives uh, with cyclosporin and then all the new things we have now, which then led to the solid organ transplant uh, world of uh, really going forward. In the second half of the 20th century, we had an increased understanding of blood flow an explosion of techniques and, and concepts of how safely to move tissue from one part of the body to another. Initially with Bacangin, with his deltal pectoral flap, which was a flap going in one stage, rather multiple stages, from the chest wall to the head and neck. And then the 70s we called the anatomic revolution, anatomical revolution, whereby basically people were dis discovering or rediscovering how the blood flow to muscles and skin were that we can potentially move it, either as a pedicle flap or as a free flap. A free flap is basically taking a piece of tissue with its artery and vein, dividing it, hooking it up again with the microscope to a different area. Again, an auto transplantation. The next major, I think, change in our thoughts uh, was from Taylor and uh, Palmer in 1987. And they basically developed this concept of three-dimensional blood flow. And it wasn't just in one tissue plane, but it was the muscle, the fascia, the skin, the subcutaneous tissue. They called these the angiosomes. And vascularized composite allograph is the latest in the advance of this long history of reconstructive surgery that dates back 3,000 years. Currently, almost all unfortunately not all, VCAs done throughout the world are under the auspices of an IRB or the equivalent. It still should be considered experimental. One of the main advances here, there's a lot of things here, the only one I think why you really uh, focus on is, is the first one, which is uh, Dr. Lee, who's actually now, who was at Pittsburgh and now is at Hopkins. And in 1991, he did these studies in rats that showed that the antigenicity of a limb is less than any one of its parts of the tissues. So with Medawar, and up till this point, it was always thought that the skin was the limiting factor of us transplanting. And the skin indeed is the most antigenic tissue in the body, the skin and the bowel perhaps. But when you add skin uh, to Fat, you had fat to skin and muscle and bone especially. You take a composite tissue, 
the antigenicity of the composite tissue is less than any individual one and definitely less than skin. And this finding actually is pushed forward to allow for composite tissue allografts because otherwise we were limited on me being able to move skin. And there's no way we'd be able to do hands or face or other parts. Those patients that are best candidates for VCA have no acceptable autologous equivalence where standard means of surgery are either not feasible, not possible, or contraindicated. Over here you have Isabella Denoir, who is the first partial face transplant. We can perhaps reconstruct a lower lip, especially, and we can, we can reconstruct an upper lip. We can reconstruct both, really. They won't look very good. We can usually do an upper lip in a male with a mustache, and it'll look pretty good. But to do both lips and have them work is essentially impossible with autologous tissue today. And it won't work and look reasonable. Double hands, same sort of thing. There's really nothing we can do that can make that work like hands will. Throughout the talk, there's double hands and single hands that we're going to talk about. In the United States, mostly it's been single hands that have been done. You have to think about the disability with a single hand versus double hand and think about the fact of, again, lifelong immunosuppression for a non-life-threatening uh, problem, which is the whole issue that comes up. And in Europe, many countries uh, have restricted hand transplantation to only double amputees. And they will not allow it on a single amputee because they say, well, it's a helper hand and it's not really going to do that much. See, with two hands, this guy can lift and do basic functions. And with a composite of the nose and double and lips, you can see that we can reconstruct something that we can't do with autologous tissue. There's an international registry of hand and composite tissue transplantation. Unfortunately, it's not totally up to date and everybody doesn't put things on, but this gives you a general idea of about the types of tissues that have been done and about the numbers worldwide. And these change, because just last week there was another hand in, uh, done in England, and there are things that are done that are sometimes not reported for a couple of months or even longer. But you have uh, a dozen or so abdomens and almost 30 faces and a bunch of hands, and then more single uh, digits, but mostly everything else. If you take a look at this list, which one do we not have either a autologous or prosthetic possibility for? Ones. Anybody? It's the only one I can figure out. It's uterus, right? That is, we might have a prosthetic. Right? So obviously we have hand, a knee, Right, we have prosthetic knees, and a larynx. We have pro boxes or electrolux things where people can talk. Now, which ones do we have no good autologous reconstructive options in an otherwise intact body? And that's basically, again, the eyelids and the lips, long segments of the trachea, and the tongue. We reconstruct the tongue all the time, but we're really just putting a piece of tissue there to baffle the, the sound or to allow for swallowing, but it doesn't move. We don't know how to make a tongue that moves and works. The rest are really balancing the morbidity of recipient autologous donor site versus immunosuppression. So the uterus I found really interesting. Actually in 2000 in Saudi Arabia, uh, they did the first uterus from a live donor. Unfortunately, within three months it failed, uh, presumably from some vascular accident, and uh, they ended up removing it. Subsequently, there's been 10 years of research, different institutions, mostly in Turkey and Sweden, uh, where they've looked at mice, rats, sheep, pigs, and non-human primates, and showed that all these animals could accept uterine transplants. All the animals, except the non-human primates, and it's not clear if it wouldn't know, they just didn't want to give it the time to do it, because that was the last one they did they needed for their IRB before they could do the adults or the humans, uh, gave birth to healthy offspring. 
I think Carell did u uteruses also. Is that right? It's part of his original series. Yeah. It's actually pretty straightforward. I mean, it's two, it's uh, basically just a couple of vessels, and it's not a technically hard thing. So last year, Turkish group transplanted a cadaver uterus into a 21-year-old female, not gotten pregnant yet. Basically, the protocol is they usually wait a year, make sure there's no menstrual cycles and everything is going okay and there's no toxicity. The other uh, justification they had here is the number of patients that are on immunosuppression for kidneys or otherwise that have gotten pregnant and need some, may need some modifications of it, but that's not been a problem with those uh, fetuses or babies later on. A Swedish group did two living-related donors from mother to daughter uh, of uterine transplants. One was a 50-something-year-old to a 20-year-old, uh, uh, and I, forgot, I don't know remember the ages of the other one. Their protocol is to wait a year and then do in vitro fertilization, and if a baby is produced, they'll then stop the immunosuppression and perform a hysterectomy. Well, then they would do another year. So they said one or two is what their protocol. They allow for two. <laughs> they allow for two. Get twins. <laughs> so who could be candidates for uterine transplant? It could be women who have uterine factor infertility, which is this new term I learned about. They've had a hysterectomy for one reason or another, or they have a congenital absence or deformity of the uterus. Could be transgender women, right? a man that's now uh, officially a woman. It could be a man. I mean, you know, it's limitless. You know, ethics talks don't, doesn't have answers. It just raises questions and eyebrows. Uh, what are the alternatives for women with uterine factor infertility? Adoption or surrogacy? And they're unique. And they're unique because they're temporary to a few years of immunosuppression. Anybody know that some other transplant that is currently done um, throughout the world, mostly in St. Louis, uh, that is also temporary immunosuppression? Somebody in the back should know that. So what do we need just a limited amount of time to put heavy immunosuppression? Turns out nerve grafts. So we have a very large nerve graft. You can put it in, get the axons to grow across, the axons from the cell body, and you have the sheath. And then you can uh, stop the immunosuppression later, and the nerve works. And people that either don't have, or it's a very large nerve that you need, uh, works very well. And Susan McKinnon from uh, St. Louis has pioneered that, and we've done most of the work on it. Interesting one is transplanting the penis. And in China, six years ago, they reported the case report of a penile transplant. 42-year-old male, sustained traumatic amputation of the penis. They don't say how. Donor was a 22-year-old brain-dead male. It's not clear if, the, clear if the brain death was after the amputation of the penis or some other reason. <laughs> this is from their article. Uh, and you can see this amputated, here's the uh, donor. It's now intact acutely. Had some vascular congestion early on. And then pretty much was recovering by two weeks. Allegedly, it was removed in day 14 because of severe psychological problems exhibited by the recipient's wife. <laughs> and the surgeons swear that it was not rejecting and it was, and it was just fine otherwise, and they have a pathology of the thing which shows no evidence of rejection. Get back to hand for a minute. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> no relationship. Uh, the first hand transplant was six, 1964. Again, then there's the early time of immunosuppressives, which were not good enough for the composite tissue allografts. And it was rejected since that time. Essentially, all the tissues of the hand, uh, tendons, nerves, skin, whatever it may be, have been individually transplanted as well with success. The International Registry started looking at quality of life uh, in people that have been out for five or ten years. And they found that most of them are able to eat, drive, grasp objects, ride bicycles or motorbikes, shave, use a telephone, and write. Most people can't do those things very well without a hand. 
they all develop protective sensation, and then more than 80% develop discriminatory sensation, that is fine touch and be able to really tell, use your hand well. Had eight year follow-up on their first transplant, and although protective sensation they had on everybody, and the discriminative t t sensation they had on the hands, but anything more proximal did not, so just have protective. There are now reports of bilateral arms, mid forearm, mid upper arm, actually at the shoulder. It's a major, major issue is what happens with the nerve regeneration and whether or not the muscles uh, that ultimately need to get renovated are going to be renovated because if it takes more than a year, uh, those muscles lose the motor implants. Uh, composite uh, transplants, there's an increased incidence of acute rejection which we don't really know why, except maybe we're just seeing it very well. It's also easy to detect, easier to treat, because you see it right away. You see a change in the skin, which is one of the controversial things, which I'm not going to talk about, as to whether or not it's appropriate to transplant to a blind person who cannot see that, and if they don't have somebody all the time ready to be able to tell, because the only thing you really see is sometimes is this change in color. There seems to be a decreased incidence of chronic rejection. This has not been reported very much, almost none in any of these patients, with hands or face. And it used to be thought there was no vasculopathy with the VCAs, and vasculopathy seems to go with the chronic rejection. Until, actually, this year, 2012, or just a few months ago, using advanced imaging techniques, the Louisville group actually demonstrated grasp vasculopathy in one of their patients. They then went back and biopsied some minor vessels in a number of their patients and found that actually it is there. We just haven't seen it yet. World experience, U.S. has about 19. Uh, the world uh, is probably about 60 now, 34 singles, doubles, and then also only in China to do a single finger and put somebody in immune suppression the whole life for a single finger is pushing it in my mind. There are about 10 hand transplant, transplant programs in the country uh, and about 24, 25 uh, in the world. Well, one of the concerns was, was this really going to affect donors and were you going to get donors? But almost none of the, none of the, the programs have waiting lists <coughs> and there's more donors than patients. Of the 10 hand transplant centers in the United States, two have done none. They just advertise, we want to do it. One of the, has done five, and one has done six, which is Louisville since 99. Maybe off by one or two. Most programs have done only one or two. So the question is why? Why so few? This is the first uh, man in the United States to get a hand transplant by uh, Bradenbach, and this is the first double hand transplant Pittsburgh by Andy Lee. Classic question, immunosuppressive risk versus quality of life. It's a tough, tough one, especially if you're talking single hand. There are many improvements in prosthetics, and if you have resources to buy the best, uh, that it's hard to justify. I have a number of, in my practice, of four limb amputees that would never even think about it because they're doing just too well with their prostheses. The amount of time it takes for rehab, which is five or six days a week for six or eight hours a day, for a year at least, and if they don't put up with this hand, this uh, rehab very aggressively, nothing's gonna work. It's like the old adage of any hand surgery, you know, you're only as good as the compliance of your patient, because if your patient doesn't go to hand therapy, you can be the best surgeon in the world, it's not gonna work. And then there's the funding issues. So it's about $2 million lifetime for any of these, uh, which is about $350,000 right away, and then $25,000 a year, and it comes out to about that. So the Department of Defense uh, has bankrolled most of the transplants you've seen, uh, definitely the faces. Uh, institutions have done it. Why do institutions put out that kind of money? Anybody know? Because the news. The PR they get is hundreds of millions of dollars they translate to. I mean, they cannot get that kind of PR. Uh, 
Now that's sort of changing now, though, right? Because Cleveland was first. They made a fortune. Boston then. Now, how, you know, So as new programs come up, it gets to be less novel, so it ends up being less of a cash cow from a PR point of view. And then you have the problems of insurance, dealing with, again, experimental stuff and something that's expensive, and most of the time they're not covering it. And thereby they're not covering the medication, not just the acute uh, surgery. Then there's the patient selection, which is compliance and psych issues. You know, I see in the burn unit, we said, you know, there's always, there's an occasional true accident, <laughs> but there's frequently some issue that goes on that leads to somebody that has a major loss. Um, I'll point out in, in a little bit, the two main patients, uh, the Cleveland's patient, which was a gunshot wound, and the Hopkins patient is clearly a self-inflicted gunshot wound nobody talks about. But that's just the classic finding. So, you know, are they pushing with this compli the psych issues or not? Is it appropriate? I don't know the answer to that. But one of the most interesting things is that Louisville screened 600 interested hand transplant candidates, and they transplanted six or seven. That is, 600 people wanted it, right? But they could only find six or seven that would meet their criteria from a physical and psychological and resource point of view. So larynx was done first in Cleveland Clinic. Um, then the only other place it's really been done is in uh, Columbia, and it's not clear exactly how many are larynxes, how many are segments of tracheas. It's, it's hard to say. One of the problems with larynx is, is that the, um, if you didn't notice this, the, the nerves don't really regenerate. And it's true if you cut the nerve, as we've heard in our ethics lecture before, and you put it together right away, or if you transplant it. Initially, for years, they said, well, why is it working on transplant? It doesn't work uh, at surgery. Well, these nerves just, for whatever reason, it's not clear. When you put them together, the muscles don't work. They're not coordinated. And even the 1998 patient still has a trach, uh, but is able to use his larynx to a certain degree, but has a chronically open mid-level larynx. <laughs> And then so you have to say, well, okay, so the nerves don't really work and I'm going to be on chronic immunosuppression. Why do I want a larynx versus a trach? So what do you need your larynx for? Well, you can speech or you can have an artificial speech. What else? Some of the things we don't think about. You can't, you're swallowing, right? You can't smell. If you can't... Bring the air by, if you have a trach that's bypassing your oral nasal pharynx, you can't smell. Whereby you can't taste very well. And then the other thing that you wouldn't think about, it's hard to lift, to cough, and strain, right? Because these are things that you have closure of your pharyngeal sphincter or making a valsalva. You can't do that with a trach. It's all open. So it's limited to what you can do. Then I've seen written that it's really hard to, to kiss as well. Obviously, people can move their lips. And I just saw a patient the other day, and, in the, and I was in, in my clinic, and I was asking him about it. I said, tell me about all the things you can and can't do. Kissing, he said he's been married for 30 years. He doesn't kiss very much anymore, so he couldn't, <laughs> he couldn't tell me. Uh, but it's, it's really pretty miserable for people, uh, which they don't always tell us unless we talk about it. We tend not to talk about it too much. There's been a number of studies done of the impact on the uh, larynx and people to function in society. And many of them end up being reclusive and depressed. Uh, but when they come to clinic, they you know, have a smile on their face and want to keep doing what they're doing. And when asked in this paper whether they would give up 10 years of their life, whether they would take the risk of immunosuppression to be able to be normal, the answer is yes. And then when you tell them, well, the nerves don't really work, and the risk of the immunosuppression, they say, well, maybe. The best candidates for face, we're going to get back to, have no acceptable autologous equivalence. We can't otherwise reconstruct with a reasonable aesthetic uh, result. We've talked about this lady already. So the technical part we really figured out. I think you've all seen that in the news. We can keep, keep the tissue alive. We pretty much figured out the immunology part. I mean, we're 
so far the ones that have been done a number of years ago are doing reasonably well. And the ethics of restoring the face for quality of life has been pretty much agreed upon uh, by most. So why is it still experimental and not standard of care? Because there are a lot of unanswered questions. Typically we compare uh, composite transplants to solid organ transplants, specifically kidney, as far as their data. And we say, okay, we use that for the immunosuppression that was initially used, and we, because we don't have our own data. Same risks, opportunistic infections, metabolic disorders, diabetes, skin cancers, lipoproliferative diseases. And most labs are working on minimizing immunosuppression. The Hopkins group is on one drug, and other ones have different, the Boston group has a tolerance program. And everybody's looking for this holy grail of tolerance, which we may or may not ever get to, probably most likely to be minimal tolerance, if you will, or just one or two drugs. Since lifelong expression, immunosuppression is thought to decrease lifespan by 10 years, at least the old stuff that we've had, the typical face transplant candidate is asked, would you give up 10 years of your life for a new face so you can function in society? And they all say yes. The one thing they're not, not necessarily told is that my understanding is that the 50% of the non-living related kidneys will be lost in 10 years due to rejection, intimal proliferation, arterial occlusion. So not only are they just shortening by 10 years, but they're actually limiting their life to 10 years. And this leads to one of the biggest controversies in face transplants today. What is the exit strategy? Well, what happens if it doesn't work? So with kidneys, patient goes back on dialysis, hands, you get an amputation. If it's a liver or heart, lungs, either the patient dies, but it's a life-threatening illness already, or they get back on a transplant list. In the face, you know, it's not a life-threatening reason why they got it. Can we just take the face off? Are there conventional donor sites left if you've gone through all your reconstructions before? And will the patient survive? It's really, really complicated. If you look at the first transplant, there's a partial face, right? Nose and lips. So if we lose that, what happens? She gets back to where she was pretty much. Not so significant. Maybe a little chin skin is missing. But pretty much, this is what she would be like if she ended up losing the transplant. As experience grew, it became clear that partial face transplants were improvements, but not great. Look at this gentleman. This actually is vitiligo from an acute rejection phenomenon, and all of a sudden everything just turned white. Um, these are clearly improvements from before, but you see seams, you see difference in skins, especially you see these people close up, uh, and they're not quite as good as you might want them to be or as people want to think, you think that they should be. And that's why the Boston Group and others uh, started thinking about full face transplants, even if it meant removal of normal skin. And it's really, really interesting because it takes a lot of guts. If you look at this kid here, all those diseases down here, and they're replacing everything here. And this is because, I think it's this guy, they had a normal chin, they left it. And they put all the face around it. And the only thing that looks abnormal is his chin. The problem is they're taking normal stuff. <coughs> is that although the skin uh, full face looks good, you really want it to look good, you really want it to hang right, you don't want it to droop and everything else, you take the bone and the sporting as one piece. It's a little bit of cheekbone, a little bit of maxilla, a little bit of, of chin. This is the... Uh, latest uh, Baltimore, Ed Rodriguez uh, University of Maryland, Maryland, Maryland group. And they took, you can see this is the guy that had the, I think, self-inflicted gunshot wound, right? He's had a bunch of reconstructive surgeries. And his cheeks are not bad, his eyelids aren't bad, his forehead just has a little scar, his neck isn't bad. And here's, they wanted to hide his seams, right? So here's the seam for his transplant. Ears, scalp, all the way down. And they threw everything else away. But in addition, they took mandible from about here to there. They took maxilla, right? And they threw all that away. 
and then they put this on. And tongue, part of the tongue. Now what happens if this fails? Is this guy going to be able to survive? Did they really talk to him about that? What happens if it rejects? What happens if he develops a tumor? Three of 23 face transplants have died already. One from China only because they weren't given enough medication, went to a rural place and ended up not taking their immunosuppressors. That's a known problem. In France, Lantieri, who's done most of the face transplants in the world, actually had a major burn patient who, when he was a burn victim, had pseudomonas sinusitis. It was a couple of years out already, and there was no evidence of any infection. They do a face on him and hands, by little hands at the same time. The question was, was it the antigen load or exactly what the story was? But he got septic from the same organism from a couple of years before, uh, and ultimately one of their trips back to the OR rested and died. Or last month at a meeting, actually in Chicago at the ASRT, this guy from Spain who tells us, oh, cancer patients, if you want them five years out, you're fine. And so he had a patient, actually it was a friend of his, who had head neck cancer, laryngeal cancer, actually 12 years before, no evidence of disease. So he said, oh, let me do your face. It recurred with the immunosuppression, and he died from it. So Lantieri tells his patients, if it fails, you will die. He is absolutely convinced of this. They get septic, they get sick, you can't get the medication off fast enough, you can't get the face off fast enough. There's no way that you can keep them alive. Especially the more we're taking out, the more bones and everything else. Because you have this giant raw surface. If you think about just the raw surface that you're leaving somebody with uh, in a failed transplant. So the next question is, are there any current uh, conventional donor sites left. And the next question is, if you have somebody that came in, let's say with a self-inflicted gunshot wound or some other trauma, and you know from all your experience and the world's experience that you can't do a really great job, and you're going to end up with one of these things. Should you skip the reconstructive trials and just go to a face transplant right away? And then you have the real problem of consent, right? Because then you have somebody that has this terrible deformity where you didn't even try, and you talk about a coercive uh, situation where, oh, I can give you the world if you take this drug. If Lantieri is correct, do we have to worry about this backup? Because if indeed we're talking about if it comes off, you want to be able to have something that you can close the wound with. Who's the correct candidate? Psychological, physical, patient's malignancies. How long is it safe? There's a bunch of talk about this. How bad a malignancy does it have to be? Is it a basal cell? Is it a cervical cancer? Is it a lung cancer? Is it a patocellular cancer, which you're doing liver transplants for? Um, children, right? You do kidney transplanted kids. Why can't we do face transplanted kids? Then there's a conflict of interest. Uh, the DOD money is a big one. Grants, a big one. <coughs> Competition, giant. Ego, even higher. Assuming that we have all the resources available and we construct almost any aesthetic unit of the face with conventional autologous techniques reasonably well, what can we not do reasonably well with conventional techniques? There's basically two. Both lips, which you talked about, and the other is both eyelids. We know how to do the forehead, we know how to do the nose, we know how to do the cheeks, we know how to do the necks, we know how to do all the other stuff. And we can get pretty reasonable results. Enough that you would not subject somebody to lifelong immunosuppression. Now, if you have tolerance, it may be different. At this meeting, a month ago, there's the American Society of Reconstructive Transplantation. Mm -hmm. This guy from France presented this mind-boggling case that drove me and everybody else nuts. The patient was missing his lower lip. No question, reconstructable. Mm -hmm. And 
in order to have ideal function and an aesthetic unit, he decides he's going to take both lips off and give them a unit, like Isabella, the first face transplant, maybe even a little nose. Problem was PTLD, post transplant lip, uh, lymphoproliferative disorder, and chronic rejection. The only treatment available for his lymphoma was to stop the immunosuppression, whereby you take both lips off and you've given him a non reconstructable uh, problem. He didn't tell us what they were doing, uh, and this was sort of just an in intermittent update. But it was just this is where this concept of IRBs and some oversight and some ethics and some control of ego really came to light at this meeting. Domino Wall 101. You know, surgery is basically principles and concepts and anatomy. So I'm going to deal with a little bit of anatomy and then talk about little principles and concepts, talk about the concept of Domino Wall and then get into Domino Wall transplant. So those of you that don't know, there's a bunch of muscles of the abdomen. There's the rectus abdominis, external oblique, and the abdomen in between. And then there's different layers of different, there's anterior rectus sheath, there's a sheath above and below, internal oblique, and transversalis. This little girl on your right never had repaired. We're now dealing with her, and that's why we have another patient like this that's even worse. Uh, who all the guts are outside. We're going to talk a little bit about loss of domain, which is when the guts are outside and the inside gets smaller. Well, if your normal development, and then all of a sudden you develop a hernia or a trauma and you eviscerate all your guts, your body was big enough at one point. If you never had your guts inside, it's not like re-putting it back in or stretching things out. We got, really got to make some space. R really a major, major challenge. <coughs> then we have the acquired defects, which are from tumors, infection, radiation, trauma, hernias. Everybody in general surgery have seen these and we've dealt with them. We deal with the size and location, so the big midline hernias uh, we pretty much know how to deal with pretty well. Liver transplant or liver surgery with the Mercedes. Kidney transplant hernia is a real, real problem. And when we have both the Mercedes and here, this is a real problem because not infrequently incisions come down here and denervate part of the abdominal wall. So the layers we have to deal with are all of them, the skin, fat, fascia, muscle, fascia again, and peritoneum. And then we have to think about are these full thickness defects, are they true losses or are they just separations? Can we get things back together, or are we missing tissue, we're missing muscle, and we have to patch it? Then is there a loss of domain? So again, the abdominal cavity is unable to fully accommodate the abdominal contents within its fascial boundaries. Basically, the abdominal cavity shrinks because there's nothing there pushing on it. And the closure of the fascia, if done too tight, will compromise the circulation of the organs or transplant if there's one in there. And fascial dehiscence uh, is, we see a lot, usually from things being too tight and poor tissue, or get abdominal compartment syndrome um, as a result of that. So the indications for abdominal wall reconstruction is loss of structural uh, integrity, exposure of vital structures, loss of skin integrity, and contour abnormalities. Remember, because uh, I get sent all these giant hernias, the small hernias are the ones that are dangerous. Small hernias, something will come through and it'll strangulate. These giant hernias may be uncomfortable for the patient, but generally they're not dangerous. And so the risk benefits are very, very different. If I have an 80 year old with a small hernia, I'll more likely do it than a 30 year old who's not very compliant patient with a large hernia. Hereby, I have to think about all the comorbidities and all the things that you want to individualize as to whether or not it's going to cause a problem or not cause a problem. So this is a guy who actually had a Whipple, right? You say, well, what's his survival going to be? And, you know, you get him to get in shape, you give him a year, he's doing pretty well, he's still pretty miserable. And he's sent by the transplant surgery, so you got to sort of do something. 
Here he is when he's lifting his legs. So to leg, leg raises. See that hernia come out. Here he is when he's asleep on the table. Really, really good sign for us. Because this is scaphoid. It's depressed. It's not, everything's not bulging out. So I don't have to worry about stuffing things in. I can just sort of manipulate and get those things closed. And then we do, we just define all the abdominal wall layers and ultimately close it. Okay, let's see you sit. So at eight months, he was pretty good shape, and he's back doing everything with no restrictions. So open wounds that can't be closed acutely due to swelling are usually temporized. We had one of these the other day in a Bogota bag. One of this guy that was resident in Bogota, Colombia, uh, called it that. Basically, a piece of plastic, IV tubing, or something that we put in just to hold everything in place and you can see through it so you can see if the bowel is alive or dead. Or a temporary mesh, frequently vicral, again to hold things in place. Vicral mesh goes away, loses strength about six weeks. A little granulation forms and then either we can close it or usually when you have this chronic situation like this we'll just put a skin graft on it. The problem is we're putting skin graft right on bowel. So how do you get that off? Well, if you wait four to six months, the swelling goes away, this loose areola layer sort of develops. And actually, you can just lift the skin graft right off the bowel, even though it was put right on the serosa. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. And there's a couple of spots that may be adherent, usually about a liver. Here's this guy before. Just look at what happens, really. He's trying to do a sit-up, or a sit-up. So again, we find the fascial edges bring them together, and get them close. Here he is, two months post-op, able to sit up. Again, the whole thing is centralizing the muscles. He didn't lose muscle. It wasn't a problem. So then, what happens if we can't get the edges together? And there's two basic things. There's relaxing incisions we can do to bring things together, or we have to fill a gap. Fill a gap's a problem. Oscar Ramirez in 1990 described this thing called component separation, which has been a big craze the last number of years. And component separation is basically, this is the rectus muscle, rectus muscle, here's the external oblique, internal oblique. And an incision is made, usually in the belly already, right here, usually through the fascial portion, uh, to separate this from this. The nerves to this come in this next layer, so you, down here, so if you don't go through the internal week, you're going to be okay. How much time do you have? Are we supposed to be done? It's supposed to be done. Okay, I'm going to go real quick then. And basically, you get things closed. I thought it was to 1.30. All right, and this is component separation, and here's the certain limitations. This is if it's uh, defect size. I'm just going to go through quickly. Here's a double kidney transplant, multiple problems. Large fascial defect. He had a Mercedes type incision, so I'm not sure why. He, because he had all these infections, was treated with intensive fascial autograft. And end up close. And I'll go through quick. This is a disaster that many people will see. And the main reason I want to show you this, I'm just going to go through, just look at the pictures. This disaster belly that we're ultimately closing. Here we're using the alloderm uh, mesh. Unfortunately, it not infrequently gets infected if left open. And then we went to a thigh and ultimately able to close this wound with a thigh flap because we didn't have, I'll go through that. Uh, and here we have the wound closed and able to actually close the donor cell with another flap. This is a different patient and I show this patient again to show the difference between we need this, all this tissue these are the donor sites that we need versus if this was a transplant patient, we could take that from somebody else and not bother with the legs at all. So, two classes of patients. One without immunosuppression and the other ones with immunosuppression. They're getting transplants anyway. Here's a guy that came to me who had a kidney transplant about massive complications. And the question was, should he get autologous reconstruction or a CTA?
There's the repeat liver transplant patients, all develop abdominal wall hernias. And the question is, would it be reasonable to harvest a part of the abdominal wall when we're getting the next liver? So it's not even a separate time, although you could do it separately. There's no donor site morbidity, there's no increase in immune suppression, and you minimize subsequent surgeries. The main stumbling blocks of CTAs is the cost of immunosuppression and the controversy of immunosuppressing non-life-threatening uh, problems. And then choosing the appropriate recipient and donor availability. If you're taking somebody that's on immunosuppression already, we don't have to worry about the cost, and we don't worry about the ethics of using immunosuppression. Considering this, I got an IRB to transplant abdominal wall, actually any VCA in somebody that's on immunosuppression already. This is a guy, he comes to me with a complaint about hernia. He's hypertensive, he has CVA, he has asthma, chest puffy, sleep apnea, and end-stage renal uh, disease until he got his double kidney transplant with a complicated post-operative course. So in 2008 he had this, he had a problem with his airway right away. He had a wound dehiscence soon afterwards with evisceration as all his guts came out at the bedside. And he kept doing that. He said, wound dehiscence, wound dehiscence. He finally put some posthum. Same thing. This was the last one, actually, a different surgeon operated on him and still got the same thing. And he was ultimately got some allograft on that granulation tissue as a temporary uh, thing and then autograft. And then it was actually sent to me as a possible abdominal wall transplant. And then I realized that I got to deal with this loss of domain before I do that. Because if I can't get all the stuff in, I can't build a abdominal wall that's that big. This is his uh, CT, which shows basically all his abdominal cavity. It started to grow, and it was clear that there was a lot of ascites. Sent him to nephrology and liver. They did liver biopsies. They did portal uh, pressures. They did everything and uh, nobody could figure it out. Everything was negative. So I made a presumptive diagnosis. I don't know if this is real or not real, but I made it, which is called the ascites attraction ascites. That is all the abdominal abdom is getting pulled on it, so it's inflammation and it's doing it. So uh, if I was right, reducing it would correct his ascites. So we drained it a little bit, didn't really change the size of the hernia. And we set up this crane in the OR, which we draped then hang things up so that we can have some control. Ultimately, I'll go real quickly. I was able to stuff everything in, but couldn't stuff it enough that we can get fascial closure, so we had to bridge it. So we bridged it with some porcine stuff. Temporarily closed it, but I knew that that porcine stuff's gonna go away. A little bit of graft here with the kidney allograft underneath it. So six months later, I was planning to remove the acellular dermal matrix. Same setup, went in, Want to get rid of the scar, have fascia to fascia. And ultimately was able to do that. And here he is, six months post up, four years after his kidney transplant, and we didn't need an abdominal wall transplant. <laughs> so most of these are relatively straightforward. I'm gonna go almost done. These Mercedes can be really, really complicated though. They always develop abdominal wall hernias, and they're upper in this area. So again, we have this loss of domain issue. I'll move through this. There's a problem with decreased volume of intradermal contents. You can wait for the bowel edema to subside, or you can transplant a smaller organ. Or you can make the envelope bigger. Component separation, uh, prostheses, or autologous fascia, or abdominal wall transplant. The problem is not enough Abdominal wall tissue for repeat livers, multivisceral or seismic transplants. Traditional techniques don't take care of this. Immunosuppressive per prosthetic mesh and non vascular tissue at a high risk for infection. Odologous tissue requires a donor site on the recipient, which I just showed you. The solution this is in the late 1990s, actually in 1995 when Cronin was here. We went to the Erie Cafe for steak, cigars, and discussion of abdominal wall transplant. And I presented to him uh, the concept of doing this. This was uh, about 10 years before they did it in Florida. Uh, and primarily in... <laughs> and then Lauren Schechter, who was my resident, 
we just said uh, he was we were planning this out. So we went to the Woodlawn Tap for this plan. And this one, we discussed how technically we do it. Do we need to perfuse it? We don't perfuse free flaps. I don't know why they perfuse uh, vascular composites. Uh, what do we do if the patient's unstable after the liver transplant? What's the limit of cold ischemia? What will be our recipient vessels? Didn't know any of that stuff. And then I had a little epiphany. This is from my old general surgery days. And that's mostly fascia. We really don't need skin in most of these situations. We just want to keep all the guts inside. And that I was making a hypothesis that the posterior rectus sheath was actually had at least a secondary blood supply from the falciform ligament. This was actually brought out uh, in 2004 in a radiographic study that showed that the artery from the right hepatic artery go, or the hepatic artery goes to the falciform, form, which then goes to the abdominal wall. Meanwhile, in 2003, Levi in Florida did a bunch of abdominal wall transplants. These were for small bowel transplants. So when you transplant small bowel, everything is totally swollen. Most of these people have had disaster bellies to start with. There's no way you're going to close them. So they have all sorts of problems with prosthetics and other issues. And a group in uh, Italy uh, did the same thing with microvascular techniques. The immunosuppression was the same. Uh, basically, they just took all this out and took the vessels underneath, and then they, the, the, since there was nothing inside because they took the small bowel, they were able to close the belly without a problem. And they have uh, this, this report in 2003. Uh, they had 23 uh, month follow up, six surviving patients, no problems with wound healing, and two deaths uh, with sepsis with intact abdominal walls. Interestingly, you would think that one would be a sentinel of the other, of rejection, and there were two acute intestinal rejections with no involvement of the, of the abdomen, and there were two of the abdomen with no involvement of the intestine. Go figure. Interesting, in his paper, he says all his, his small bowel transplants were done under the IRB, but he felt that just taking the abdominal wall as, you didn't really need a separate one, and so this was considered to be okay, so he did not get an IRB for that. So the problem again is lack of fascia. And in 2010, we proposed a new thing, which was the posterior rectus sheath liver CTA at the time. And it, we reported a case report along with uh, Dr. Millis and Harlan, and then went back and did two of them and reported these two in the same journal uh, this past year. So the concept here is you have the liver, you have the hepatic artery and mains, and you have falciform ligament, and that goes and supplies a peritonealized live piece of fascia in the posterior sheath. Here it is in situ. And so we have this nice healthy piece of fascia that should withstand infection. Here's the vessel. We've done six of these in five patients. One patient lost their, vessel, their liver and we had to do another one and we did that right after the same sort of thing. One patient died of pulmonary sepsis. His abdominal wall was intact. All of them have had some sort of complication, except for this last one, which is 16 year olds, who was actually done superbly, superbly well, uh, recently went home. Uh, the ages were 12 to 16, but not necessarily correlating with the donors. So we put a 20 year old liver in a 14 month old. Here's the ischemia time and the cold and warm ischemia time. We timed how long it takes to harvest this, and we start at the beginning before anybody starts, and it's about 35 minutes. It's not long. There's basically four different categories of the four different groups, and I'll just go through this quickly. So this is for the multi-organ transplant. We have two cases, one and six. In this one, we had, the, it was number one, we had the liver uh, and two kidneys, and there was no way the abdominal wall was gonna tolerate that on a little baby who's had multiple sur surgeries. And the other one was uh, a liver and a kidney. So here's a size mismatch. We have a recipient's 14 month old, donor's 20 year old, needs a liver. So we split the liver, they split the liver and keep the Porsche attached. And then we have, so this kid now has a half a liver, or part of a liver from the 20 year old, and is almost his entire posterior rectus sheath, which we can drape all over everything and basically close, patch, reinforce 
entire abdominal wall with live tissue. We've had no complications of uh, the abdominal wall. Biopsies, uh, multiple biopsies shows no rejection. Again, pa first patient died uh, from sepsis, everybody else alive, and the immunosuppression was not altered due to this. So immunos uh, the single artery uh, and vein that they use for their liver transplant perfuses this thing, keeps it alive. And in contrast to abdominal transplants described by Levi, we don't have to do any, anything special. All we've got to do is keep it attached to the liver. So it can be used for a bunch of different things, organ mismatch, multivisceral transplants, and just when you have a hostile abdomen and you can't get things closed and we want to close it with live tissue rather than either autologous dead tissue, a donor site from the patient, or a prosthetic. The key about it, though, it only works if you think about it at the time of harvest because you can't go back and get it unless you're getting another liver. So just in summary, the essential differences between autologous transplantation and allotransplantation. transplantation one has no immunosuppression. The transplant is usually one big surgery, multiple reconstructive surgeries for the autologous. Anyway, I remember the, I didn't put them in here, it takes too long with that massive dog bite kid that ate his face. I'm still operating on him seven years later. No donor site scars for the allo. Donor site scars and potential morbidity for the auto. Cost of surgery and lifelong immunosuppression. Cost of multiple surgeries. And we compared, we compared that case actually with Maria's first case seminar from Cleveland and it comes out about equal. If not, if I have a major complication, it actually puts us over. There's limitation of our donor sites though. Not only number, but type. If we need hair bearing skin and the scalp is gone, the patient doesn't have hair bearing skin anyplace else, so a significant amount that we can make a scalp. Uh, and other examples of the same thing. One of the theoretical things, again, if we get down to this minimal tolerance level, is off the shelf surgery. So you need something, it doesn't, it's not very risky immunosuppressives, and we just take it from somebody else. And it's basically a change in thought process from reconstructive surgery, which is doing our best to make things as good as possible, to restorative surgery, basically really replacing parts uh, the way they were made. Thank you very much. Yeah.